The next speaker is Mr. Nate Birkbeck, and the title is Memory Fragmentation and Blurt in Ruby. Hello. Thank you, everyone. Um, you're all very quiet when you come into the, the rooms here. It's like a church. Um, of course, the reason it is so hot in here is because I am now in the room. Uh, and this talk is going to be fire. It's going to be lit. Um, OK, so my name is Nate Berkepec. Um We're going to talk about memory fragmentation and bloat in uh, Ruby. Um, I am the maintainer of Puma now, along with Richard in the front row here. Um, I write online about um, Ruby performance issues at my blog, speedshop.co. Um, I wrote a course called The Complete Guide to Rails Performance. If you purchased it and you're here, thank you very much. Um, uh, that's how I pay to get to conferences and stuff. Like I don't, I, I'm a consultant and this is like all out of my own pocket. So um, if you have bought the course, thank you. You have paid for me to be here. Um, okay, so <laughs> Rails is awesome. It's very fun to use. Um, but often it uses a lot of memory. Um, this is not just like a Rails problem, this is a Ruby problem as I will show. Um, but uh, most of, most, uh, you know, 50% I'd say of my clients um, come to me um, and whether they know it or not, they have memory issues. That the, the uh, bottleneck in terms of how many Ruby instances they can run on their, on their hardware uh, is gated by how much memory they have available. Um, the reason why memory usage is so important is because so many of us work in memory constrained environments, um, whether or not it's Heroku and like the sort of prototypical 512 megabyte um, dyno. I think most people run, if you're on the cloud, you're running in a, in a very restricted virtual private server. Um, and even if you have your own hardware, we all know memory isn't free, it is cheap, but it's not free. Um, and uh, I haven't actually gotten to learn enough about this yet, but I know that you know um, Ruby is used in a lot of different environments here in Japan. And if you if you're using Ruby in a memory constrained environment that's not a web app, I'd actually really like to hear about it after the talk. Uh, if you could find me in the hallways or something, um, I would find that really interesting. Anyway, everyone has memory cons uh, constraints. No one has unlimited memory, so um, that's why this should, uh, issue should concern us as Rubyists. It's also very difficult to debug for Rubyists. Um, when you have a memory problem, there are some tools to help you fix those problems, um, but they're often difficult to use, difficult to understand, um, and uh, so it, we should try to have, if there's anything we can do as a language or as a community to cause these memory problems to happen less often, we should do it. Um, part of the reason why it's so difficult to understand is because memory has so many layers, so many, so many um, layers of abstraction between you calling object.new and then that data actually going into a RAM location somewhere in physical hardware. Um, the first layer is, of course, your Ruby code itself that's calling object.new or um, you know, creating a new array. Um, then the Ruby runtime, YARV, um, has some stuff that it does in organizing its own memory usage. Um, then the Ruby runtime has to interact with your memory allocator. Um, for most of us, this will probably be glibc uh, malloc, but it could be j malloc or tc malloc or some whatever allocator you happen to be using. Then the allocator um, may or may not interact with uh, the hardware MMU, which is what translates um, virtual memory addresses into real memory addresses. And then the MMU interacts with your actual physical hardware, pulling stuff in and out. Maybe there's um, something that's uh, swapping memory. Um, so really, there's there's just so many layers of abstraction, and memory use issues, excessive memory usage, can come from any one of these layers. Um, so that's what makes this so difficult to, to work with and to understand. Um, so I think as, as Rubyists, we don't want to think about memory. Um, so we should either make these problems happen less often or make them easier to understand, debug, and fix. OK, so I'm going to start with bloat. Um, I call uh, memory bloat uh, this pattern of having constant memory usage in an application and then seeing a sudden spike in memory usage, maybe even doubling memory usage. Um, and then that tends not to fall off. It tends to stay at that new level of, you know, it, before it was 512 megabytes of RAM per process, and then something happened, and now suddenly you're using one gigabyte of memory per process. I call that memory bloat. Very common pattern. 
Uh, looks like this. It looks like, hey, I'm just kind of doing my normal web application stuff, and then somebody did something, and now we're swapping, and you know, the application is really slow, and it, and it really stinks. Um, so the important distinction here is that memory bloat is excessive memory usage. You could say it's a kind of bug, but it's, it is strictly necessary, at least for a short period of time. So what happened here is someone did something that required one gigabyte of memory to be, to be used at one period of time. We need to actually have, be using one gigabyte of memory at, at that point, otherwise we'll you know, crash. Um, so we, we did need to have this amount of memory in use at one period in time. But then, usually we don't actually need that memory afterward, so why doesn't it, why doesn't it go down again? Um, if this behavior is primary, uh, primarily a function of the, the way the Ruby runtime works and also the way your memory allocator works. Um, and it can contribute to Rails processes or uh, background job processes that use gigabytes of memory each. Um, I think, uh, I don't know if he's in here, Julian told me like the, uh, that they've seen like 14 gigabyte worker processes. I've seen that in other, um, in other applications that I've worked on for clients. Um, this behavior um, of, of memory being used quite a lot at one time and then not being returned to the operating system can create these really big problems because basically your long-term memory usage of a Ruby process is the maximum memory you ever need at one time. Uh, the, the primary culprit is basically large collections. Um, it's people, you know, loading the entire user table into memory or, you know, dot all dot each is uh, sort of excessive, which is why I put it on there. But it, it can be things like dot where, you know, some condition is true, but like all records in the table are have it true, right? Um, and uh, so you load in 30,000, 50,000 active record objects into, a, a, into an array, and well, that's one gigabyte of memory right there. Um, so that's a pretty common culprit. Another common culprit is people calling map on a large collection. So if you just call map, right, we have to create a copy of that uh, array or an uh, enumerable. Um, so now you have twice as much memory as you did um, on the, the previous line. Um, and uh, another big one is people just like exporting like data. Um, so like they try to like export a very large CSV file. This is like super common. Like biz, you know, marketing department needs the CSV of every user, and then like marketing guy hits the endpoint, and like now you have doubled your memory usage. Um, so. One, one solution really is just like don't do this. Um, it, it's, it's a function of like just um, wor working in development with data that looks like production-like data so that when you do call user.all.each in development, you get 40,000 rows. You don't get 10 from deep, you know, your seed data. Um, that I realize that's not possible for all environments, so it's not a perfect solution. Uh, that's the only one I've ever seen really work. Uh, and just being aware of Okay, if you know of, of using destructive in place modification for certain collections that that may be large. Um, the, the so then the, that, that that explains like the big spike, right? But what explains why we can't get that memory back again? Why can't we get it back from the operating system? So that's malloc's fault. Um, this is from malloc internals, which is uh, a wiki page that describes how glibc malloc works. It's very good. Um, if you're interested, I would I would go take a read. Um, note that in general, freeing memory does not actually return it to the operating system for other applications to use. So in other words, free does not mean free. Um, it's not guaranteed. Uh, if the top chunk in a heap, the portion adjacent to unmapped memory becomes large enough, some of that memory may be unmapped and returned to the operating system. So all this means is that Ruby has um, a big uh, memory heap, right? And the only space that malloc can free is if the if there is a, a, a continuous large chunk at the end of the memory address space that's, that's open. If there's anything in that space, it can't free it. Um, so if you have one gigabyte of memory in your heap and then there's a, a live memory location at the very end of the heap, we can't free anything. Uh, this is kind of specific to malloc, which is why I bring it up because this is what most people use. Um, other allocators deal with this differently, such as JEMalloc. Um, so this isn't necessarily true of all allocators. It's just the way malloc works. Um, 
this this often gets open as a as a bug on the malloc tracker. Um, like people say, hey, if I do this, like I create a memory leak, and it's like, no, this isn't actually a memory leak. Um, everything is is still being taken uh, taken care of, and everything is tracked. Um, but uh, get, we cannot give address spec. Sorry, we cannot give address space back to the kernel when main arena is discontinuous. So memory that is not just all packed together. And that is expected behavior. OK, so what are some things we can do to prevent memory bloat? Um, well, we can make things which might cause memory bloat more painful to do. Um, DHH has called this syntactic vinegar. Um, what I find with memory bloat is that most people are like looking for someone else's, like they, they think it's like the alloc they think it's someone else's fault, but it's really like they were doing something crazy, like calling dot map on a one million uh, element array. Um, so like they're doing these things, but it's not obvious to them that it's their fault. So by making uh, these interfaces more painful to use, to, we can kind of say to the user, hey, you might do something wrong here, so please be careful. You can, you can do this. But please be careful. Uh, here's an example. Mini test. Um, this is what a mini test stub looks like. Um, it's like a block format, and like it's it's actually really nice to use for just like stubbing time. Um, but if you start nesting these and like having like four stubs in a test, it gets really painful to use, uh, and that's deliberate because mini test and Ryan, the author of the library, does not want you to use that many stubs. Uh, that's part of his testing philosophy. So mini tested deliberately makes stubbing and mocking difficult. Um, so some ideas. Um, I, I'm not, you know, a huge. Uh, I'm not like a Rails team member or anything. So like, I this is just some spitballing here. Um, maybe we can have like a strict mode, where uh, we force you to select only the fields that you need. Um, and if you try to access a field that hasn't been selected, uh, we blow up. So like, you have to always use dot select in, in Active Record. Or maybe um, instead of uh, dot all dot each always trying to fetch every row, um, maybe we can make it always batch mode with, you know, uh, that's the dot find each behavior. Uh, maybe an enumerable. We could even mix in something that if you try to create an enumerable that has more than a million members or something, I don't know, it just raises an exception. Obviously, we can't do that in production. We'll only do it in development. Uh, but maybe that will, you know, surface these problems uh, sooner. Maybe we just log. I don't know. Um, but you know we can do this with Ruby, so maybe maybe that will help us um, make these things more obvious to us. Uh, but this can be abused. Ruby is is a language where we don't want to think about memory. So if we do this sort of painful interface thing too often, I think it makes us think like a computer, and that's like not the point of Ruby. I I, I think Ruby is deliberately English or or spoken language like, um, and so we don't want to overuse this technique because then it just doesn't feel like Ruby anymore. Um, like this is kind of like why um, I know Matt's doesn't like type annotations or has, has, has refused changes in the past that were annotations for the compiler's sake or like for the runtime's sake um, because that's, that's something that Ruby should just be smart enough to figure out for us. We shouldn't have to think about that as programmers. Uh, this is just something I pulled out of the Ruby man page. Um, what, they're mean, what they mean here is that Ruby is memory safe but I just like the way it said, no user level memory management. That's, that's a slightly different statement than memory safe. It's saying you don't have to think about memory. So I think this is a deliberate feature of Ruby, so I don't want to overuse painful interfaces here. The other solution is just to not allocate as much. Um, Rails tends to allocate more objects than Sinatra, so maybe we just use Sinatra instead. I don't know, I mean, Rails is a powerful framework, that's why it's so popular, so maybe this solution is not, um, uh, sustainable in the long term. Okay, the other thing we could do is just try to be more aggressive about deallocating or, or, or giving memory back to the operating system. Because the bloat part, usually the painful part of it is not that we suddenly use one gigabyte of memory. The painful part is that that never goes back down. So what if we can just get rid of that part of the problem? The reason we can't is the next problem, fragmentation. Okay, so fragmentation. Fragmentation usually manifests itself as a memory usage curve that looks like a long, uh, slow logarithm. So it, it, it's memory usage that seems to approach a limit, but never quite stops. Um, this is basically caused by the fact that your, your um, memory is 
gradually starts to become more, less and less continuous. It's not just perfectly packed um, together at, at one end of the heap. It starts to sort of look like Swiss cheese. Uh, it starts to have a lot of holes in it. So we have uh, six blocks here. We allocate something that takes up three blocks, and then we free the middle block. Um, so now we have two spaces, one of three blocks and one of one block. Um, we cannot put, obviously, a two block you know, um, memory uh, allocation here. Um, that happens on a very large scale over and over and over over the 24 hours or whatever that your Ruby process is alive. And after a long period of time, we start ending up with these really, really weird sized holes all over the place. And uh, eventually, um, the, the heap can really actually grow almost without limit. Um, it can grow without, you know, up to like 10x its size purely due to the fact that the, the size of these holes are all over the place and they're such strange sizes. Uh, yeah, it looks like Swiss cheese. Um, in theory, this shouldn't happen, um, especially on a, on a web application, which is sort of my area of expertise and, and like what I work on every day. Um, in theory, right, if you think about it, um, a Rails application should start up, allocate 400,000 objects or whatever um, to like get its to load in code and to set up caches or whatever. And then each request should be transactional, right? Like we should allocate you know, 40,000 objects for this request. And then at the end of that request, in theory, all 40,000 should just be immediately free, right? Because HTTP is stateless and so I don't need to remember anything about that request anymore. In practice, um, that is not actually the case. Um, I haven't been able to kind of find the smoking gun here, uh, but uh, there, what tends to happen is in that 40,000 objects we allocate for a request, not all of those objects will be immediately garbage collected. Some of them you know, might get added to um, longer lived uh, collections. So maybe we add something to a cache, for example, and then that, that memory location in the cache will live on beyond the length of this request. Um, so there are things that happen during an allocation, oh, uh, 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 an allocation that you think might be transactional, where it's just like, oh, I just need 40,000 objects and I can throw them all away when I'm done. But that's not the case in the real world and some of these objects stick around for longer, which is what causes the fragmentation. If, they, if we could get rid of them all immediately, there would be no fragmentation, right? Because it would just all be empty space. Uh, but because they're not, we end up with um, lots of free space, object, lots of free space, another object, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so fragmentation is, prob is, is, is primarily a function of the runtime um, and your memory allocator. Uh, this isn't really a problem with, you can't, you can't fix memory fragmentation by the way you write, write your Ruby code. Um, there's nothing you can really do about it at the Ruby level. Um, but this is something that happens because of the way Ruby and the allocator works. Um, it's, what's so frustrating about fragmentation is that it's often mistaken for a memory leak um, because it looks like memory increasing without limit, therefore it must be a leak. Uh, that's not necessarily true. Um, a memory leak is not memory increasing without limit. It is memory which we have sort of lost track of. We, some, somebody, either the allocator or whoever, um, forgot to free the object. They sort of lost, the, they, they lost track of it, and that does cause increasing memory usage, uh, but the uh, fragmentation can cause a sort of similar looking pattern uh, but uh, that free space is all accounted for. It's not lost to, the, to uh, malloc. It, it, ha it says, hey, I have this four kilobyte hole here. Can someone please give me a four kilobyte object? And if you never do that again, then that looks like increasing memory usage. Um, the way you can tell it apart quickly and easily as an end user is the, what the memory usage graph looks like. So if it looks like a, a, a linear line that goes up at a constant amount, a, at a constant slope, uh, that's probably a leak. If it's logarithmic growth over the course of, of six to 12 hours, um, where it sort of starts very quick and then slows down, that's probably fragmentation. Um, memory leaks will never slow down. Um, they will always you know, leak the same amount that they leak. Um, and after 24 hours, you'll have a 12 gigabyte process. Memory fragmentation is much slower, especially as the process gets older. So after 24 hours, maybe it uses uh, one gigabyte of memory or something like that. So 
um, looking at the shape of the curve and also uh, after long periods of time, how much memory we're using are good ways to sort of quickly tell them apart without having to break out, you know, Val grind or a huge heavyweight C tool to, or a heap dump or something like that. Okay, um, another way that we can sort of measure how much fragmentation we are experiencing is by inspecting gc.stat. Uh, this is available in any Ruby session. Um, I don't really actually remember when this was added. Um, so it's a hash that contains some statistics about GC and the current state of memory. Okay, so to talk about what gc.stat actually means, I'm gonna have to explain GC internals in 60 seconds. Uh, here it is, here's what GC is. That's how it works. Um, okay, so every object is a 40, is assigned, I'll say, a 40 byte R value. R value is this magical C struct that you can access in different ways. Um, you can access it as a string or access it as a number. Um, but uh, each object has a, a, a corresponding R value with a size of 40 bytes. Um, those R values are organized into pages uh, of 16 kilobytes each. So 16 kilobytes minus some header space is 408 object, uh, sorry, 408 R values per page. Um, so some uh, R values will contain a pointer to where the object actually resides in memory. Some objects are small enough that we can put them directly inside the R value. For example, with strings, um, on a 64-bit operating system, uh, if the string is 23 characters or less, we can fit it in the R value, okay? If it's larger than 23 characters, we have to call malloc and get a pointer to somewhere else, okay? And at that point, Ruby's knowledge of where this object is in memory stops, okay? It just calls malloc free, I think realloc if it has to make it bigger, right? Um, but uh, it, it, it has no knowledge of where that thing is in memory other than a pointer. It doesn't manage it beyond that. So it looks like this. Uh, this would be a heap page, um, and there's many of these, right? There's probably like 80 just by when you start an IRB session. Um, they are lists of 408 R values in each page, plus you know empty slots. Um, and uh, some of them, some of these R values contain data right in there. Some of them will point to this malloc space because um, it, it literally just calls malloc and gets some gets a pointer back, and then now it's the allocator's problem. Ruby doesn't touch it anymore. Okay, so here's what I'm saying about gc.stat and how we can actually measure fragmentation. Um, so if I start a new IRB session, G, uh, run a major GC five times, and then I can look at the number of live slots. So that's just the number of R values currently live, okay? Um, and then I can look at the number of Eden pages. So pages, heap pages, um, the ones I just told you about, can either be in the Eden heap or the tomb heap. Eden pages just are pages which have a live object in them tomb pages are completely empty. The reason that it separates that out is because tomb pages can be freed back to the operating system. Eden pages, we have to keep them around. And uh, GC, like the GC algorithm, will, will try to put new objects into Eden pages and not tomb pages. That's sort of like a, a fragmentation reduction strategy, right? We want to reuse the pages we're already using and not any empty ones that we might have. So if we take the number of live slots, and then divide that by the number of slots that we have open total available in uh, all Eden pages. Um, so that's what this number is coming from. This is GC internal constants heat page object limit. That will come out as 408 on a 64-bit system. I forget what it is on 32-bit, it's different. Um, so if I basically just divide the number of live objects by the number of slots in all used heat pages, um, I get a, a percentage, which can be used to sort of gauge fragmentation. Um, a perfectly unfragmented Ruby um, object space would get 100%, right? Um, that, that would mean all slots are used and uh, there's no empty space and um, that's, that's a completely unfragmented, totally used heap. Um, a super fragmented heap would be like 1%. Uh, because we have objects all over on different pages. Maybe, you know, I have only one object in each 
uh, heap page, and I have 400 pages, so that's 400 divided by 408 times 400, uh, which would be very fragmented. That would be very bad. Um, so that's, that's kind of one quick um, rule of thumb that we could use to sort of gauge heap fragmentation. Um, another one involves how large, or like basically how many heap pages we have and where they are in memory. Um, this is kind of a, a quick hack. Um, so if I have three Ruby heap pages um, in memory and then I, I free one of them, so like uh, let's say I have uh, 12,000, sorry, 1,200, 1,200 um, objects, so that takes about, about three heap pages. And then uh, 400 of them, which happen to be right next to each other um, in my second heap page, I free all of them at once. So that means this page is now empty, completely empty. There are no R values in here. Um, then I can, I can free that page, um, which is what Ruby will attempt to do. So I free it. Um, it's no longer mine. I, I call free on it, and malloc maybe frees it. Um, so this heap is now only two pages. But gc.stat also keeps track of how long the heap is, basically like how many pages long it is. Uh, that's called the heap sorted length. And this, so this heap has a length of three, but only two pages. So basically like if we have a very long heap, but very few pages, that would be a very fragmented heap. That would be a heap with many empty, slot, uh, empty spaces. So we can get an idea with that by just using gc.stat heap sorted length. So we take the sorted length and divide it by the number of Eden pages. Um, if that is a, a large number, that would be a very fragmented heap. Uh, if it's one, it is a not fragmented heap. OK, um, so I was talking about sort of the object space there. That's the list of R values. Um, this is not the only place that fragmentation can occur, because it can also occur um, in the main Ruby heap, which is where I keep large strings and large objects, right, where I just called malloc and got a pointer. That space as well can get fragmented. In fact, I think that's probably one of the main areas that Ruby pro uh, programs get fragmented because that area accounts for more than 50% of total memory usage in a Ruby program, uh, which makes sense if you think about it because heap pages are not that big. They're only 16K. And like maybe if your application uses a ton of memory, you have like 200 of them, but that's, that's not actually that much memory. Um, so really, because Ruby's only like knowledge of this space is just in terms of like the pointer it gets back from malloc, um, this is really kind of mostly the allocator's domain right now. This, is, this, this part is the allocator's fault. OK, so. Um, this is one way that um, an allocator can really increase memory fragmentation, uh, per thread memory arenas. Um, this feature, uh, which was added to glibc malloc a long time ago, um, probably like 2012, or maybe earlier, um, uh, it, it con contributes to this problem um, in Ruby applications which either create and destroy many threads or do a lot of I.O. So um, you can imagine uh, that's sort of like the worst case scenario. That's, that's Puma, right? That's Puma is creating threads and using many threads, and it's also doing a lot of I.O. because it's a web server. Um, this is also uh, Sidekick has this problem because Sidekick uses a ton of threads, and usually most Sidekick workers do I.O. They have to, right, to go to Redis. Um, so if you're doing this in Ruby, um, per thread memory arenas may be ver increasing your memory fragmentation by, by quite a great deal. So let's, let's talk about why. What is a per thread memory arena? Um, a per thread memory arena is designed to reduce lock contention uh, between threads. So um, when you start a Ruby program, you have one memory arena it, from malloc's perspective. You have one main memory arena. Only one thread can access that memory arena at one time, for obvious reasons. Um, so there's a lock. So if you have two threads that want to read from Ruby's heap at one time, um, they, one will wait. One will wait for the, the other thread to be done and release the lock. Um, this is, will slow down multi-threaded programs. So the, the glibc malloc developers decided to come up with a way to reduce that lock contention. 
Um, so what they came up with was per thread memory arenas. So um, I, I said that like they invented it. I'm not, I'm not sure they did. Um, so all it does is uh, if there's a lock contention, uh, one thread is waiting for the other thread to, redu to release its lock on the main memory arena, uh, it will create a new memory arena and just say, hey, thread, you get this arena over here as sort of your scratch space. So if you don't need anything from the main arena, um, we're just gonna give you this space over here and you can, you can do your work over there without contending with this, this other thread that's using the main arena, right? Those, those per thread memory arenas that get created, I think are by default 128 to six, maybe 64 megabytes in size. Um, that's virtual address space, so it's not like gonna increase your program RSS by 128 megabytes every time. Um, but because now each thread gets its own sort of little space to do work, um, that can increase fragmentation just by itself because now instead of one large arena where we have to manage fragmentation in that, now we sort of have like a bunch of small little bins where objects are sort of scattered across, right? And it sort of like doubles the problem each time that we create a new memory arena where now we have um, that problem where ma malloc can only release space, which is at the end of the heap, right? So now we have that problem each time in every single memory arena. Um, this can get really bad um, in programs that uh, have a pattern where the thread, um, there, there are many threads and they sort of um, are created and destroyed very quickly. Uh, databases have this problem. Uh, I, it seems to me that Ruby seems, many Ruby web applications also have this problem. Um, so, like I said, you create a new memory arena every time a lock uh, contention is detected. Uh, this can happen up to eight times the number of cores. So if you have a four core machine, we can have up to 32 per thread memory arenas at one time. Uh, and like I said, that is basically saying now fragmentation can happen 32 times as often. Um, this is again from malloc internals. Um, uh, the number of arenas is capped at eight times the number of CPUs in the system, but the trade-off is that there will be um, less fragmentation. So what they're, they're saying there is that each time you create a memory arena, you create more fragmentation. It's capped at eight times the number of cores because if we did that, there would be even more fragmentation. This number, this eight times cap is different on 32-bit systems. I don't know if anyone actually runs Ruby on 32-bit anymore, but if you do, you should be aware of that. So we can actually ch uh, tune this behavior with an environment variable called malloc arena max. Um, this is the part where if you have this problem, you're gonna wanna write this down. Um, you can, this number is basically saying malloc, do not create more memory arenas than this number. Um, rather than eight times the number of cores, you can set this to any number you want. You can set it to one, you can set it to two. Of course, when you, if you set it to one, for example, now, in theory, you're increasing contention for the lock, for the main memory arena. So it should make your program slower. It's very easy to test. Just set this environment variable. It won't break anything. Um, if your application is slower, you know how much slower it is. Um, Heroku tested this um, when they s uh, created the Cedar stack. Um, they had complaints when they created the Heroku Cedar stack that applications were using more memory um, and Terence, I think, tracked it down to per thread memory arenas and actually test it. How much slower does it make our, a uh, uh, the usual program if we change malloc arena max to a smaller number? Um, and generally he found that changing this number to, to two reduced program speed by like 5%, but could decrease memory usage by 25 to 40%. That generally aligns with my experience. Um, this trade-off is usually really good for a background job, for example. So like, it's not really that important if your background jobs take 5% longer to execute, but it probably is important to you if Sidekick could use 40 to 50% less memory. Um, this is a, an actual client graph. Um, this is a Sidekick process running on Heroku. Uh, this deploy right here is where they changed Malloc Arena Max to two. Um, so you can see memory usage for them was cut by about half. So we had about one gigabyte uh, sidekick process, which is reduced to 512 megabytes. That's probably the most extreme example I've ever seen. 
of um, Malak Arena Max fixing people's memory problems, but it is kind of one of this one of these like magic settings which can really make a difference if you are creating many threads or running a multi-threaded Ruby application or doing a lot of I/O, right? Because uh, if you're not doing a lot of I/O, then the Ruby threads are not running at the same time, so they can't contend for the main uh, main memory arena. They don't lock. They don't create arenas. I think this is probably a m possible major source of fragmentation and excessive memory usage in uh, Ruby web applications. So what what can we do about this? Um, we could just reduce the number of objects that we create because the fewer objects you create, the less opportunities for fragmentation you create. Um, that's, like I said, not really sustainable. Most of us have Rails applications. You can't say, like, rewrite your Rails app in Sinatra. That's just not a solution. Um, one other thing we could do is move more knowledge of the heap and, and of the main memory arena into the runtime. There's a lot of programs that do stuff like this, like memcached uh, uses slabs, um, programs based, there's a precedent for sort of moving some of this management into the runtime because the, the runtime understands its allocation pattern the best. Um, so it's sort of like managing malloc a little bit more. Um, these are just some strategies I thought maybe might help in Ruby core, uh, buddy blocks, using multiple heaps, slabs. Um, it, what you're doing is sort of just removing the allocator from the equation. Um, speaking of allocators, uh, you can just use malloc. Uh, it seems to be better on this uh, fragmentation score. Uh, Sam Saffron said that re just using JE malloc reduced their overall memory usage by like five or ten percent. I think that is almost entirely due to less fragmentation. Um, so it seems to work a little better. Um, it's very easy to use. Like literally, you can just dynamically load it in with LD preload. You can also compile Ruby with JE malloc. Um, it works well, it's production proven now because Sam uses it at Discourse. So that's sort of like the easy solution. You can also do it on Heroku. Um, I help maintain a Heroku build pack or JE malloc. You just add a build pack, you're now using JE malloc, you're all set. It's very easy. Um, Rust actually uses JE malloc specific features um, in that way. So the other thing is to, to, if we could just move stuff around in memory, we don't have a fragmentation problem. Um, this is what Aaron's working on. If you can just move stuff into the empty spaces, you no longer have a fragmentation problem, problem solved. So maybe that could work. Um, uh, the other thing we do is like, we could just give some hard defaults, like force everyone to use J malloc, force everyone not to use memory arenas. Um, this is almost never gets merged in Ruby core, these kinds of changes, so this is kind of out. My point is that there is always a trade-off. Um, there's a trade-off between using memory and making the program faster. Um, so these solutions will never fit everyone. Um, you have to do what's right for your application. Thank you very much. About a few minutes left, so uh, only one question accepted. So do you have any question? I didn't talk too fast. <laughs> I, um, this was like kind of a very high level strategic talk. Um, not to do like the whole like buy my book thing, but I, I have like a very much more like step by step tactical thing in the book that I sell it's at that address. Um, also, my blog has a lot of stuff like this for free. A lot of this is fairly specific to the structure of MRI. Do you find the same sort of things hold true with, say, JRuby or other No, the JVM has, I think, a few compacting garbage allocators, so they tend not to have this problem. Um, yeah, what other ones are there? Like, yeah, and truffle runs in the JVM, so yeah, yeah they, don't, they tend not to have this problem. It, this is a problem with all C programs. Like, all C programs have fragmentation issues because most of them don't compact their, their, their GC. Uh, you can't at Z. I heard that more one or two question is okay. So, do you have any question? Uh, 
Hey, who are you? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, t I'll tweet it. I didn't upload it yet. I'll tweet it right after this talk. At, it's my name. You mentioned that some of the stuff is already like defaulted by Heroku, like the page. Not not at all, right? No, no. Is is there a good reason? I mean, that's probably. I think basically Terence decided that that trade-off was not something that they could make for everyone's program. Like they couldn't say everyone should be doing this setting, which, which makes sense because Heroku is very wide and like not even it's not even just Ruby. Right? Like they have so many different languages on the platform, so. If, if you're hitting memory limits, uh, uh, we throw, a, it's, I think it's an R14 error, and there's a web page that is like, here's what to do if you have an R14 error, and it is linked from there, like, hey, this is one of the things to look at. Um, but yeah, as, as you mentioned, it's like, a, we don't want to reduce your app performance by 10% or 5% or whatever, like, if you don't need this at all, if you're not even coming close to your memory limits. Oh, and, and Nate, why are you so awesome? <laughs> Thanks, bro. <laughs> Do you have any question? So if you have a question, uh, please ask him after this session. So thank you so much, Mr. Nate.